Okay, welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, two announcements before we begin. We are accepting applications for MPC POP Scholars for 2024. This year-long program trains new and early stage investigators to write competitive NIH grant proposals. All UMN faculty and research scientists are welcome to apply, as are faculty from non-R1 institutions. Priority will be given to those who are less than 10 years from their PhD who have not previously received an NIH R01. Application instructions will be available starting tomorrow on the MPC website. There's a little flyer over on the table by where Claire is, if you would like to pick one up. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Claire, if you could also show us the other flyer. Um, <laughs> This is uh, the Life Course Center call for 2024-2025 uh, pilot grant proposals. Uh, we'll be holding an information session on Zoom at 10 a.m. on November 15th for prospective applicants. Find all the details for the call for proposals and for the information session on the LCC website. And now I will introduce today's speaker, who is history professor Dave Hacker. He was one of the first research assistants on IPAMS starting in 1993. Today, he is a demographic historian with expertise in 19th and early 20th century census data and the use of indirect methods to estimate long-term population trends and differentials. Today, he will be talking about the use of IPAMS multi-generational longitudinal panel data to estimate estimate mortality and fertility in the pre-registration era of the United States. Thanks, Dave. And here is your mug. Oh, thank you. You hear me now. Uh, we've been working on this paper for uh, more than a year, and uh, it's, it's put a, a fair amount of effort in it. Hopefully, some of that effort will show uh, today, because we're, we're pushing uh, data in ways that were really never intended. As, as you know, censuses were our censuses of the living population. We're trying to use them to estimate the dead, right? the people who weren't there. Uh, and doing so with a really exciting new data set that we've produced in-house here, the IPAMS multi-generational longitudinal panel data set. Uh, and it's just a great time, I want to say, to be a historical demographer because these things are just coming online. We can do things we never were able to do before. Uh, and that's exciting. And it's also uh, the reason this thing's still not published a year after uh, we first started it. So I've called it Bricks Without Straw, uh, the use of the IPAMS MLP data to estimate mortality and fertility in the pre-registration era of the United States, and that is vital registration. So before there was vital registration. So this will be an indirect based estimates uh, that we're gonna be making. And, um, uh, and I'll just want to start the paper by saying a little bit about traditional estimation and demography and uh, indirect estimation. Uh, then a little bit about our data set, the MLP data set. Spend most of the day today or hour uh, talking about this method of estimating child mortality uh, using the data set, our methods, some descriptive results, some evaluation. Evaluation is difficult. Um, there's not a lot there to evaluate our results uh, against. We have a little bit, um, but we're, uh, we're pushing that as far as we can. Uh, and then some example applications towards the end of the talk, some the construction of life tables. Uh, we're going to be constructing a life table for every combination of year, state, county, race, and gender uh, between 1850 uh, and 1940. So we construct about 100,000 life tables uh, in this paper. Uh, we, for the same uh, units, we construct new estimates of fertility, including marital fertility, total fertility, age-specific fertility rates. And then an application where we use these data, where it really gets exciting is we're trying to model at the individual level uh, uh, factors related to child mortality. Okay, got a few students in my PA 5301 class here teaching methods right this term. And uh, I think the second week uh, of the class, we do this. 
We talk about how to estimate the basic demographic rates, crude death rates, age-specific death rates, age-specific fertility rates. And they look something like this, where you have an enumerator, uh, let's say in crude death rate, a number of deaths in a given year in a population, and you divide it by an estimate of the mid-year population. Ideally, you know, one that's uh, you know, controlled for the actual person years at risk, but mostly, most often a census, a mid-year uh, population. Uh, so a traditional estimate, numerators, come from a vital registration system, uh, you know, birth records and death records. Uh, and the denominators come from a census. So two different sources to create what is really the fundamental units of demography. With age-specific death rates, one can construct a life tables, life expectancy, age-specific fertility rates, total fertility rates, and others. So one needs both types of sources. And I'm gonna ask you, what do you do when you work in an era where the numerators are missing? We spend a lot of time in Steve's class watching our denominators, but the numerators, you just, they just don't exist in some regards, right? Uh, because the vital register, a little bit of the history in just a minute here, um, it makes it a little more complicated uh, when you don't have a numerator. Uh, you have to be creative. And I wanna say it's the condition many historical demographers find ourselves in, also the condition that many demographers of developing nations find themselves in as well. The vital registration system may be there, but it's not complete. Uh, you're never quite sure of its accuracy. So uh, a bit of a background here. Um, the United States is relatively late in developing countries in the 19th century to establish a system of vital registration. It was left up to the states, many of the things we do here. Uh, nationally, we had a census, uh, and the census was required by the Constitution to be conducted every 10 years for the purpose of apportioning Congress, but nothing was required uh, in terms of vital registration. So um, some states picked it up about 1840, Massachusetts, 1850, but most did diddly squat. Um, despite that, nationally, uh, there's an attempt to organize what's there in 1900. And this is the establishment of a national death registration area. Um, and it kind of means to kind of uh, uh, make some consistency among the states. It initially includes only 10 states that had vital registration system at the time in Washington, DC. There's a push to get all states to adopt vital registration uh, systems and they are considered complete in 1933 when Texas comes into the system. But uh, anyone who studies that period knows that these records are very incomplete and under-registered for some time after 1933. Um, not, despite that, if you're looking for a national life table, you can find one starting in 1900, but it's based only on these 10 states in the District of Columbia. And those 10 states are not typical states. You probably imagine, right? They tend to be more industrial, they tend to be more urban. Death rates are in fact higher there. Uh, so these initial life tables are, are, are very much biased, especially for the black population of the United States, which tends to live in states that don't get registration systems till much later. You know this well, I, I assume, right? Um, so it's considered to complete 1933. Birth registration areas even later, um, uh, also considered uh, complete 1933. And I find this ironic from a historical demography standpoint because this is about the end of 150 years of the fertility transition, which begins uh, in the early, late, early 19th century, maybe late 18th century. So we have about a century and a half of dramatic social change, demographic change, and then we get good data, right? So, uh, so I, I think it's a weak empirical foundation for understanding the, the, the timing, the factors involved in the demographic transition, uh, especially its spatial dimensions, uh, which are, has been lacking. Uh, and I think I, I find it sad because in some ways the United States is an ideal factory for a uh, place to test hypotheses because we have a very diverse population. It's very diverse across space by race, ethnicity. So uh, we could hope for a lot more. Okay, so what do we do? We turn to indirect 
estimation methods. And there's a whole um, mild industry of indirect methods produced in the 1960s and 70s. This is a United Nations manual, uh, manual X, or do you call it manual 10? Oh, yeah, you, you've trained on this, I bet. Man, manual 10. I like X. X has a little more clash today about it. Uh, uh, developed mostly for developing countries. Uh, and then there's a uh, more recent uh, uh, coming out of Europe as well. And the common methods that are, are discussed here is something called two census methods of uh, mortality estimation, where you take a census of living people and you look at the ages of, let's say, people 10 to, to 20. And 10 years later, you look at the number of people 20 to 30 and you say, oh, there's been some attrition. That must be mortality. You also have to assume the population's close to migration. Well, unfortunately, our United States is not, as you probably know, one of the most uh, receiving nations at the, at the period, but you can do maybe something with the native born population. There are ways of looking at uh, estimating marriage uh, from the proportion who are married at each age group. Uh, Kathy's got several papers with Steve on this kinds of methods. Uh, there's a method of fertility estimation where you take the number of living children attached to their mothers and say, well, let's assume 10% of them died or something, and you back project them and you determine you can create age-specific fertility rates. I've done a lot of that in my career. There are also, and if you're working in developing the uh, world, there's a chance to make a survey question that you want. And you could ask something fairly direct. Um, and unfortunately, we lack the time machine to do that. Um, but there are a few questions asked in some years. And in 1900, 1910, for example, the census asked, how many children have you given birth to, to every woman? And how many of those kids are still living? So you could subtract the two and figure out how many of her children have died, right? So there are a few unique cases. Uh, in fact, that one example is probably one of the landmark books in uh, historical demography. Uh, Sam Preston and Michael Haynes' uh, Fatal Years. They used what was then a very new source of public use sample uh, of the 1900 census. I think it was a one in 750 sample of, of households, something like that. Uh, and they wrote this book, and it is still an excellent book. I still assign chapters for kind of one of these landmark studies that looks at the factors associated with child mortality in this period of very high uh, uh, mortality. I'm going to come back to this study uh, in a little bit. It's been cited over a thousand times, which is a lot for a historical work of historical demography. Um, so that's the kind of the light shining like the drunk looking for the keys under the light post. If you will look at 1900, and I've done plenty of that, uh, but what if we wanted to know something about the whole period, not just 1900, right? Uh, well, we need a new method of indirect estimation that does not rely on a special question asked only in one year. Enter the IPAMS multi generational longitudinal uh, project MLP data set. Um, and this data set, uh, which a number of people in this room have been associated producing uh, over the last five or more years, um, is a data set that links individuals in the full count census data sets across census years. So you can follow them across time. And it links them using their names, and things that don't change about them, like their place of birth, their year of birth, approximate year of birth. So someone that's 10 in one census should be about 20 years old in the next and 30 in the next. Um, uh, other things, uh, I, I'm not gonna jump into this because this is a, a presentation of itself, but we've, I wanna say we've emphasized in this project, uh, reducing type one errors. People we link are the people that, that we want to link, right? We don't link everybody, but the people we get seem to be pretty accurate, right? Um, the number of successfully linked individuals across these two censuses, the numbers are big. We're using full count data sets. So in the smallest 10 years, 1850 to 1860, when the nation's only 20 million people, we link about 6 million. And then to 1930 to 40, which is the end of the study, and uh, so far the end of the IPAM's MLP, although 1950 presumably be coming in soon. 
uh, we link 52 million individuals. Here's our method in a nutshell. We link married couples only. So we're really sure the same two people. And we look at their kids in the first of the two censuses. I'm gonna call it census A. And we try to find them 10 years later in census B. We're only looking at very young children. So a child who's age one in census A should be 11 in census B, 10 years later. Um, we don't find them, we think they're dead. I mean, that's it's a lot more difficult than this. Uh, but that is the essential uh, method. So evidence of absence, in this case, we're calling, you know, no, an absence of evidence is, is evidence of, thank you. And I, I knew I shouldn't try that. You're not supposed to do that. And there's a reason you're not supposed to do that. I'll get into this in a minute, uh, which is why we haven't published the papers. Um, we're linking about 750,000 couples uh, in the first census, 10 years, about 4 million uh, towards the end here. We think, I mentioned those numbers, in terms of linkable couples defined as couples who survive and they don't move out of the country, and they're present in both censuses and they haven't been undercounted, we think we're linking about 60% of the potentially linkable couples, right? We've done all kinds of analysis of, do they look different than others, slightly more literate than the ones we don't link, slightly more likely to be living in the Northeast, slightly more likely to be farmers, but these are really small differences and we've done our results weighted and unweighted, it's the exact same thing, okay? Um, so here it is. Let's take this uh, couple here, uh, Joseph and Mary Napier, uh, in I think uh, the 1900 census. We find them 10 years later, 10 years older, uh, in the 1910 census. Their kids, Maxine, Claudine, and Will, in census one, we find Maxine and William in the next census, Claudine is missing. Uh, where is she? We think she's dead. Um, we don't know she's dead. Uh, we're going to infer that she died. Um, this is another wrinkle we've been working with. It's going the other way sometimes. You find children in census B who should have been there in census A. What the hell are they, right? Here we have Steve Fry, age 10, in 1910. And you go back 10 years later, and we find his parents and his sister here, um, but we don't find him. He should be an infant. Um, he's missed. We're calling him for the moment undercounted. Um, there's a large suspicion, a census, of, and you can see it in the age distribution, there's not enough kids, age zero. And it seems strange that someone would forget their kid, but they do. Um, the other possibility is, is that Steve's really nine and people round up their ages sometimes. They call him 10, uh, he's about 10. Uh, so this is a real problem for us. And we, we're, we're wrestling with it. So dead and undercounted is what we're getting here. Okay, prior to this, MLP does a great job of linking people, but it doesn't link everyone. Um, we, I said we we're trying to make sure we get have no type one errors. And we're finding children in both censuses, and it's the same child, it hasn't been linked by the IPMS MLP project. So we do a process we're calling forcing. Um, and here's an example where uh, the Hobsons here in Missouri have three children in census A, 1870, four, four, and one. 10 years later, the Hobsons have three children as well, 14, 14, and 11. The MLP project did not link them because we just weren't confident that A.L. Hobson was Abraham Hobson. Um, and so we could say deceased, 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 undercount it, undercount it, undercount it. And what we're doing is saying, nope, they're the same people. We're forcing links and we, we're forcing all kinds of things here. Um, you know, there should not be these things, right? We're trying to be fairly aggressive, but we're only going plus or minus three years. Um, we first started looking for, uh, uh, I skipped the whole Yara Winkler kind of, when you make these links, they're made by computer. 
no one's looking at these by hand. You don't make 60 million links by hand. Uh, they're made with an algorithm that, that tries to match its name similarity, and things aren't spelled the same. So uh, there's, there's opportunity there for missing. So we force people. Step one. Then we started getting some results. This, we were presenting these last year a little bit. Let me start with undercounts. Um, and three censuses here. Our undercounts are running about 3% to most children. And then you get this massive undercount. 20% or more? Do I believe that? Maybe, maybe not. You know, it's just high. Uh, are people really not enumerating one out of five of their children age zero? Maybe, um, but it makes me nervous. And I'm going to show some results for mortality. Eventually, we're going to throw these people out. We, we try to keep them as, as long as we can. So, undercounts. Let's go with mortality rates. Um, here is an assumed standard for 1870 to 1880. I'm going to call it assumed because it's an estimate I produced. I know how bad it is potentially, but there's nothing else there. Um, this are the age-specific mortality rates. We assume characterize the nation in 1870 to 80. Here's what we're getting with the IPMS MLP data set. And this is pretty typical of what we were finding we started seeing rates a little higher than the expected with every year of life, which worried us greatly. Um, we also tend to overestimate mortality in most years. And what we've been interpreting this to mean is that we say we can't make a link, they're dead. There's, kids are probably out there somewhere alive and we've just overestimated the mortality because we couldn't find them. We couldn't link them. And it makes sense that the older ones are harder to link because they may have left home by the time they're 15 or 14. It seems very young to us. Now, these are not orphan children or children with one surviving parent. These are, you've got two living parents. And so how many 15-year-olds are out uh, away from home? Well, some, apparently, if we believe this, this model deviation, right? So we're overestimating mortality, plus probably more so among the older kids. Um, and we've been struggling with this. And then last month, this data set drops uh, from Buckles, Price, and Clement, the census tree data set. Uh, and this is produced uh, uh, in partnership with Family Search uh, and other genealogical companies and our data. They're using the IPMS MLP data to establish links of people across census years. They're also using private or genealogists who are working at home making links between their family members. They use all kinds of four or five different data sets. So we thought, well, let's see if we can find those kids we thought were dead, right, in their data set. And we can, we can find some. Uh, and so what we've, we're currently at, and we're still troubleshooting this, is if we, if the census tree project has three other sources, not the IPMS MLP, that says this child is alive, we bring them back to life. And that's a good feeling. Uh, the resurrection algorithm, you know, uh, if you will. Uh, so uh, we do so, of course, it drops our mortality rate, and here's what it looks like. Um, here's the IPMS. Uh, uh, Without the census tree adjustment, the green line is with the census tree adjustment. Here is the standard, which is green quite well in this year, except there's growing divergence among these infants. It's getting worse here, right? Um, you know, an, again, a problematic group that I'm going to drop in a little bit here. But in this area from age one to five, we're starting to get what we think are really good results, right? Uh, so we are quite thrilled with that. And that's our current uh, uh, standard. So we can do these results. We cannot do 1870 to 80 because the, I'm sorry, 1880 to uh, 1890 or 1890 to 1900 because that census was destroyed in a fire. So we have a big gap in our series, but we can do uh, mortality rates. This is national by race, you can see. Um, uh, every 10 years, and we, those results look really good to us. This surprised me. The up, uh, 
upswing in the Civil War decade of the 1860s. Um, there's been a lot of speculation that perhaps you have a war that kills 750,000 people and lots of refugees. Maybe it has an impact on children, but we hadn't been able to estimate it before. We're estimating it now. Um, okay, so how good are these estimates? <laughs> Trust me, I don't know. Uh, uh, there's a, you know, because there's nothing to compare it against. But I mentioned already that in 1900, 1910, we had this little moment where they ask a different question. How many children have you given birth to? How many of those kids are still living, right? Uh, and it's possible to take the, there, this person here, Emma, had given birth to three living children, two are still living at the time of the census. You can convert that to a life table parameter. It's not easy. Well, it is easy. It's just an algorithm. Uh, but it requires you to estimate how long the, her children were exposed to the risk of dying. You have to use things like the age-specific fertility rates of women in her, her cohort, et cetera. But you can do it. You can convert them to uh, uh, proportion dying. And we can compare these estimates to our estimates in these years, right? And here are some state estimates. Um, I don't know if I think this is good or bad. Um, but it's the only thing we can do at this point. This is uh, uh, down on the x-axis here. It's the children ever born, children surviving estimate in each state. And here is our estimates uh, on the y-axis. And this is New Mexico. You were going to ask that probably. Um, you know, uh, but uh, we get, well, it's correlated. Uh, I'm happy to see that. Uh, I'm happy to see that. It's correlated. Uh, and then I'm going to show you the black population. I'm going to skip by this one quickly. Okay. Yeah. The way levels are, are completely different parameters right now. Not everything's been converted to MLP, uh, to uh, life table parameters, right? Uh, here's county estimates uh, for the white population. R squared is only 0.55. Um, you get a lot of bulking in the middle. Um, but again, I'm grateful. It's positively correlated. Uh, and here is the black population. Uh, we, we're only plotting estimates where we have at least, I think, uh, 1,000 children uh, to, to get an estimate from. Because, well, sadly, in this case, not enough ch kids die. You know, you're trying to measure something that happens fairly infrequently. Um, so, oh, we're encouraged. Um, how about what we really want to use these data for is what Preston and Haynes did for 1900. We want to do the same kind of thing they did for the whole span of years. How does it perform in the kind of analysis that they ran? So we can run their models using their data, children never born, children surviving, and the uh, IPAMS MLP data. And this is a model looking at the, um, um, they're, in some ways, they're different metrics. So we we don't expect them to be that close. You know, one's measuring over a 10-year interval. One's looking back over an unknown period of time. Uh, they're completely different metrics. But we created a model of child mortality with about uh, uh, 15 covariates. Um, and if you look at the uh, Haynes and Preston uh, results, they're suggesting black mortality rates are about 60% higher than white child mortality rates, all else being equal. And we're finding it's uh, about 45%. Um, in terms of uh, birthplace and ethnicity, we find similar but different levels. Um, you know, they, uh, we both agree that the Canadians have higher child mortality. We split opinion about uh, those parents uh, who were born in Great Britain. We agree that Ireland, the parents from Ireland have higher child mortality than native born, all else being equal. We agree that, you know, these kinds of things. Here are the results of occupation. Um, we find that white collar workers enjoyed lower child mortality. Um, well, we have very similar results. Um, and I want to say this now about Preston Haynes. One of the things they emphasized in their book is that these occupational differences were not large relative to what people may think. We tend to assume there was a mortality gradient that's large in the past. And they take this to say, well, you know, if you're a physician, your child has, you know, a couple percent higher, lower chance of mortality. It's not big. You know, there's not a lot of knowledge about how to prevent child mortality in this period. That's their emphasis. But anyway, similar results there. Um, similar results by size of place. 
uh, maybe not, not the exact magnitudes, and then by literacy, literate parents, um, children of, of literate parents had 25% lower child mortality rates than children of illiterate. So we were thrilled. This is what we want to use the data for. Now we can only test it in this particular decade, and we're just going to have to assume that it works for the other ones, but uh, we're quite, quite excited by that. Okay, let's uh, take, show you some. Uh, one of the nice things is we can start looking at spatial differentials in child mortality. We had no idea. And this was one of the really exciting things for me, you know, to see these maps for the first time. Um, here is uh, child mortality in 1880, which has never been mapped before. Um, and don't ask me what's going on. I'm just trying to get to make sense of these things now, but obviously the Mississippi, lower Mississippi and Red River areas are, are, are having high child mortality, probably malaria here, uh, absolutely. Why the Appalachian? Uh, range has low child mortality. No, uh, a more extended breastfeeding is usually the thing that helps in this period. Um, but uh, we're doing this for every year, every census year, every county that we can map with enough cases. Um, here's the black population. I mean, talk about a standard. There are no standards for the black population to compare things against here. Um, we get similar kind of rates of, of high mortality in this area. Up north, we get um, I should say, sometimes we, we map the state estimates when we don't have enough cases to do county. These are mostly probably New York City kind of folk. Um, uh, so black mortality, again, every year, every uh, gender. Okay, a few applications, and I will uh, allow some questions here. What we want to do with this is create full life tables for every county, year, sex, race combination. Um, we want to now use, uh, I mentioned no child fertility estimates. I'm gonna make some here in a minute using the new child mortality estimates that vary by county. Uh, and then give you an example application where we model in a, a child mortality in a different year. By the way, you can interrupt me at any time. I've been talking for, can I get a question right now? Okay, um, first, we want to create new life tables and on scale here um, because we don't have any. We have uh, a life tables for each decade for the white population only going before 1900. Um, so what we do is we fit an assumed standard life table uh, using a brass two parameter kind of logit model with a fixed slope. So really it's a one parameter model um, uh, and uh, then we, you know, we take the antilogents, the LXs, and we then construct the life table from it um, using just the child mortality estimate. Um, and I'll give you a better estimate, a feel of this here. This is a life table uh, for the decade of national table for 1870 to 1880. So what we get for the IPMS MLP is this here. We get a 10-year mortality rate for kids 0 to 10, 1 to 11. Right, so from that, we need to create uh, a life table parameter proportions dying. Everybody remember demography, I hope? Did you take your, uh, I, I'm not bothering to explain these things. This is proportions who die uh, in this age group. Uh, and then you use the model to, whoof. Should you be worried about that? Yes, you should. Uh, because you have to assume you got the right model, right? Uh, but hey, we have no other data, so we're assuming we're right. Uh, we get age-specific mortality rates of all ages, and from that, everyone who's taken the PA5301 knows you can create a full life table with survivorship uh, and life expectancy. Here, white males can expect to live 44 years uh, at birth, and females 43.9 years. That's unusual. Typically, in most populations, females live longer than males. Uh, this is a high fertility high mortality pa uh, population, and you find higher uh, age-specific mortality rates in childbearing years. Um, so uh, uh, anyways, with life tables, one can do a lot. I just want to sell them for just a minute here uh, and say, I mean, obviously, it's kind of interesting. What's life expectancy at birth? Uh, but you can use them to project populations. You can measure net migration rates. There's all kinds of things one can do with life tables. 
and you can create fertility estimates using reverse survival. You ever heard this phrase before? You can take a population that's living, apply the life table and know how many were born in some years before the census, right? So they're quite useful. Um, and here's where I gotta give Jonas props. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a mad coder. Um, uh, he, we have produced over 100,000 life tables for the United States between 1850 and 1940. And we're gonna make a data set. We keep saying we're gonna do this because people are, are honest now because we, we shouldn't have said anything. Um, uh, where you can download the data set and it's, and it's not just useful in terms of making these kinds of projections, but sometimes uh, you want, want to know the environment someone grew up in if you're interested in let's say uh, early life conditions and how what that suggests about later day life, which brings us kind of more to the present, right? Um, so we have about 100,000 life tables uh, for this period. Um, fertility. Uh, with life tables, one can make better fertility estimates because I mentioned we have number of living children. We don't know how many were born alive. You need a life table to do that. I'm gonna give you a quick uh, illustration of what's called the own child method of fertility estimation. And thanks to the IPMS, it's easy to connect children to their parents in the micro data set. And you can make a little matrix of mothers match to their own children. Uh, and you can tabulate it for each region. Here I have just as an example, children age three who are co-residing with mothers age 27. And you know how many of those are might maybe in, let's say in a county or a state. And you also know how many women age 27 there are in that area. So you can go back three years before the census when these children were born, which is 1867, use your life table, inflate the children who are living to the number who were born, three years before, born to women, not age 27, women age 24, three years earlier, right? And you can take the number of women in the county and find out, well, there's probably uh, a few more age 24, because some of them died between age 24 and 27. You inflate that number, you create a ratio, you have an age-specific fertility rate. You do it for the whole spectrum uh, of women, mothers age 15 to 64 with own children, zero to 14, we don't go any further because kids start leaving the household. You, it's harder to match them to their mothers. Uh, so you can measure fertility rates in every single year, 15 years prior to each census, and then they kind of overlap with each other for five years, which is nice. Um, so there's adjustments for census under enumeration. Oh, where do we get those estimates? You saw from the IPMS MLP. Uh, you need to adjust the other, a couple other adjustments I won't go into, um, but from this, um, we can get age-specific fertility rates, total fertility rates, age-specific marital fertility rates, oh, excuse me, um, total marital fertility rates. We can do the indices, colon trussell indices uh, of fertility, marriage and marital fertility uh, for each of 15 years prior to the census for each race and each uh, county, right? So uh, I'm not gonna show you all those results, there are many, um, but I'm just gonna show you a map of the total uh, fertility rate of the white population in 1880. Um, you can see uh, in the Northeast, it was only about two to two and a half children per woman. This is an, prior to modern contraceptive technology, of course, right? Um, so already women are achieving pretty low fertility rates in uh, this period, 1870 to 80. And then in the Southwest, I'm gonna call that the Southwest. There's, by the way, there's very few people out there, you know, on the West, uh, you know, at this point in time. Um, we have six and a half to 10 children per woman. So maximum kind of uh, uh, uncontrolled fertility there. This measure here, uh, probably many of you haven't used these colon trussell fertility uh, indices. This is the little M index, and I'll just say it's an index for uh, for determining where couples practice parity dependent control, which is a very modern form of birth control where they have a target number of children in mind and they achieve it, right? They stop at two or, or three. Um, where are couples achieving uh, uh, modern forms of kind of fertility control? It's It's the Yankees. Yeah, they're peculiar people. 
uh, and they and they move by the way across the Midwest, and you almost see this. You still see it in, in presidential elections. Cleveland votes different than Cincinnati, where I'm from, kind of thing, right? Um, so that's uh, here is the black population, uh, which is has very high fertility rates and also low ones in the Northeast, but again, very few people there. Um, this is 1910. So many years later, well, 30 years later, another generation later, and we see that total fertility rates that were low before in 1880 and now across the Midwest and into that kind of source of really the New England uh, migration stream, right? And even as late as 1910, we still see very high fertility rates uh, in the Southwest. But again, we didn't have county maps before. All we have was kind of a re regional estimate. So this is really new stuff for us that we're excited to see. Um, here's the black population in 1910. Um, low fertility in the, in the North. This is right at the beginning of uh, the Great Migration, which uh, takes about eight to 10 million, how you count, uh, Southern blacks and, and rural areas to the urban North. Very few up here at 1910 at this point, but uh, it will transform it. Okay, five minutes uh, left, and I wanna give you a quick application of these data. Um, and this was for a, um, we realized at some point that the book I've already mentioned twice, now the third time, uh, as a landmark book in historical demography at its 30th anniversary a year ago, or two years ago, we put a conference together uh, and had a lot of papers and we published a special issue. Elizabeth has an article in this uh, uh, collection of social science history. And uh, Jonas, me and uh, Martin Drevey, also from Lund University have an article in it as well. And we are using the method I outlined here to, to estimate the relationship between wealth and child mortality uh, in 1880. Um, why should you be interested in that? Uh, I know I am. Uh, I'll, I'll say that uh, there has been some debate about how how much uh, uh, a fundamental cause income and socioeconomic status is in mortality. This is from the sociological literature, Phelan and Link and others say that socioeconomic status is a fundamental cause of mortality. And it doesn't, you know, it, the causes of death can change, the period, the years, um, but somehow resources are leveraged by the people with resources to obtain lower mortality in different periods. But some historical demographers are saying, well, let's say you're wealthy in 1880. What can you do, right? Because you can go look at your latest homeopathic journal uh, or, or, you know, and there's just no good directions. There's no good science. Microbiology coming a few years later, right? There is a sense, dirt is not good. Yeah, so what? Yes, that's right. That's right. You want to, you avoid bad smells, uh, right? So how much does this matter? Well, uh, we have in 1870, 50, 16, 70, are the only years that they collected wealth data. Preston and Haynes were working with occupation, which is a crude proxy of socioeconomic status, you know, white collar, blue collar. Here we know how much money people actually had, and they reported it in the census. Well, let me cut to the results here. Um, we find a massive wealth gradient in child mortality. People in the top decile of wealth holding uh, had much lower child mortality. Uh, they're all, all lines, uh, but the, the thick black one is the nation, and we did it for different regions. Uh, oh, the axis, that's proportion dying relative to the reference group, which is people with no wealth, right? So. Um, uh, about, uh, uh, and it, again, th there's, this is a period where there's only about 10% child mortality in a decade only. I mean, uh, I should watch my words, adjectives, that's a high, but it's, you know, 10%, so about 3%, uh, you know, maybe 30% uh, th lower child mortality rates, right, uh, among the, the people. We looked at different regions, so we agree that income and wealth was a fundamental cause of uh, the mortality mortality gradient here. Okay, um, I'm done. We do have a to-do list. We're still kind of troubleshooting uh, our results, investigating outliers. Anytime you use full count census data, there's something crazy, you know. 
a county where everybody's married, uh, you know, and um, uh, we are trying to do a, the more comparisons that we can can do, uh, and including uh, Martha Bailey's life in data set. Um, but we think we're close now, and and I shouldn't do this, but we're going to say we're going to have a data set available soon for public download. Some acknowledgement, there's a lot of people here making the IPMS MLP. I, uh, wow, if I start naming, I see Matt and Kathy. And Steve, I mean, there's a lot of people. I'm going to miss somebody. Uh, so uh, it's great to be here and be a historical demography when these um, demographer and these sources are coming out. Uh, and there's, of course, the center grant uh, that we, you should acknowledge always. Right? Good. Yes, Deborah. Two yes. All right. I know. Yeah. Oh, all right. All right. This okay. Place. So yes. yes, of course. I mean, it's an obvious question, right? You're only matching when you have two surviving parents. You're in a, a period of high maternal mortality. I mean, what's the probability of having two surviving parents from one decade to the next? Is is that it's about ninety percent? Uh huh. Um, not uh, that high. What? Well, okay. Yeah, ninety percent uh, for having two. So you know, uh, you know, there's a chance that either one of them could die or both of them, right? Uh, so uh, uh, of, and that's a really crude figure. I just kind of pulled out of the air, right? Okay, now. well, that Elizabeth is, uh, asks that is if it's conditional or unconditional. Assuming they're independent. Yeah. Assuming they're independent. Okay, so um, you found that wealth and income really matter a lot. Surely. Those that that when there are two married people who have who are who stay together, there's a higher likelihood of them being better off, wealthy. Is that possible? Yeah. Is that linked? Yeah. So okay. Yeah, there's lots of potential biases here. We thought about a lot, and uh, some we can't do anything about. Uh, but you know the 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 one that that makes me lose a little sleep at night. I shouldn't tell you this, but the ones uh, is that. Uh, Wealthy parents, not only are they easier to link sometimes, it's not a big deal. We can read our results and we get the same results, um, but maybe their kids stay home longer, right? And it's the, it's the people who are in poor circumstances that need to foster off their kids that maybe we're not linking, right? Now we're, having a, we're finding a huge gradient. And I, you know, I'm, I don't think that many kids are leaving. I mean, two living parents, this is, I'm trying to do some research here. It's amazing. There's not much published or anything on the age kids leave home. Uh, well, there is something, but it says, you know, median age is like 22, 25. You know, it's way up there in the 19th century because people on farms, they stay there until they can uh, buy enough their own farm. Uh, but clearly that's what wor worries me. And I think you went right to the question I was hoping no one asked. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're all, you, this is incredibly interesting, and we're all trying to understand what happens to those kids that yep. disappear. Yep. And um, one of my thoughts is the that a lot of people couldn't afford to keep their kids, and they sent them to live with grandparents or yeah, other relatives. Yep. Do you have any sense of how many were lost that way? No, I don't. And, uh, and it is a problem uh, because it, it works in the direction you said, right? Um, you can look at kids not living with their parents. You can do a cross classification of that. And that data suggests to me, again, you don't know those kids or parents are alive or dead. You can see them in the census. You can see a percentage and it grows from a um, small number to a larger number with age. Uh, so you can see that. Um, at the same time, I don't know if their parents are living or not. And if you try to estimate that number and in, in use some life table estimates, it comes out that at age 15, that potentially all those kids who are not living with parents have dead parents. You know, the, the chances are quite high that that's the, the case. Also, uh, I'm going to ask you, who is the, the reporter with a census? Is it predominantly the mother? Because in our research, contemporary research, we find that women are far better reporters about ages and even sometimes number of kids. That's a great question. No, I, I mean, it, she's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, could, could I follow up? Yeah. Because I, I was thinking about that and thinking, what if those women with newborn babies are being like sequestered and, and they're not 
answering the door to the census enumerator. And so there's a bias in terms of who is doing the reporting about the family yeah. because, because there's a newborn in the house. Yeah. Well, uh, you can check it in the report. You can check in 1940? One, I, I, well, I don't know. Uh, but you're absolutely, these are great questions, uh, uh, terrific questions. There's a painting from this period of the census enumeration. And, and the, the father's giving the answer, and he's doing this, like trying to, yeah. he's got a public expression on his face. <laughs> yeah. And there are small, ch small children hiding behind the mother, right? Uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah. Now, the, uh, it, of course, if the family's missed completely, we won't link. Right. Uh, so that's, that's potentially it. But in terms of the uh, proportion of living away from home, it looks like, you know, that's mostly all explained, if not entirely explained by mortality of parents. Yeah, so in 1940, you do have the uh, respondent variable okay. so that you can identify, but I'm not sure it was captured in the full count. Oh. But you could use the sample data right, right. To, to make some guesses. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, the other thing is, it's you, you limit it to married couples, presumably because you're more confident that they're the same people. Yeah. But really, all you need for that confidence is some kind of a dyad. So if you had a parent and one child, both linked, right? You could probably be pretty kind con just as kind of child. I'm not interested in their mortality. Yeah, not uh, linked. We could do that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you know uh, what I'm finding? We're trying to measure something. Let me hold this closer. We're trying to measure something that doesn't occur that often, right? Uh, five, six, seven percent of the kids die in the decade, and in, in the early years, even fewer uh, in in the later period. So when you're trying to measure something like that, any type of you know, if you get the wrong couple, you link the wrong couple, you, those children die because they're not there, right? Uh, so you have to be really confident with this link. And uh, but you're right. I think another diet we could we could explore that. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about your maps with where you're backcasting the child and the women population for the fertility. That's I'm thinking about questions. That. I already see what's yeah. <laughs> the twenties where people are moving there a lot. Like, Frontier. Yeah. Can you check it against earlier population totals and see if you're backcasting like more women than were there? Oh, that's great idea. And I, I haven't even thought of that one. I mean, obviously, county boundaries are changing rapidly in the 19th century. They're they're going from a you know very large counties to small ones. And uh, if you're a geographer asking that question, you know about the modifiable area unit problem or whatever you call that. Did I get that right? Something like that. Uh, and, and how that is, how, uh, but that's an interesting idea. But we are um, not doing anything. It is full, you know, uh, we're assuming that if you're living in the county in census B, your kids were born there. And uh, we could look at children's birthplace, state, not county, uh, to see if there, how many are, are, have moved. You know, it is a mobile population. So this, these are probably messy. You know, I'm okay with a little bit of, I'm a historical demographer, a little imprecision. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm just lost what you're saying. You have them linked. You can just see where they came from. That's right. Uh, well, no, we linked uh, the, the par parents, but we know their residents, you know, census A and census B, and, we, and they do change. And so we could treat those couples in a separate way. Um, you know, uh, sometimes we attribute the kids to the first, residents and sometimes the second residents so that is possible yeah well, yeah they, with just birthplace you can do but he see i think you're saying residence itself mm -hmm. which is taken in each census and we can see that change of residence yeah. my, my question though was i was very much struck by that graph you showed with the age profile and mortality and in particular the big drop in age zero mortality that you found once you started incorporating those census tree links. And I wonder if you could, do you think that that's the, the right number? Do you think there really is like a very shallow age profile? No, or, I don't. So I'm curious, what is it about the, like going to the census tree that gets that to happen? You know, uh, that's are asking good questions. I don't know if I have a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> that result is, is all of like 48 hours old. And uh, it dropped, it dropped for, I, I, I haven't thought it through. Um, you know, uh, it is one of those problematic ages, and it's also a problem uh, it, with the census date is the same, 1850, 60, 70, and 80. It's June 1st. Uh, but then in, you know, 1900, is, which is, I don't know, April 15th, and then it goes to January 2nd in 1920. I, I, you know, it's, it's, and it's difficult to make these kinds of, uh, so things throw around. 
And I just kind of got to the point where like, let's just throw them away, uh, get rid of them. But, uh, but the, I don't know, that doesn't make any sense to me why they would drop that much uh, in that year. Sorry, it's not a great answer for your question, but it's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Dave. Yeah, first, I just want to say this is really interesting and exciting stuff. So I'm, I'm sorry for just picking it apart, but right. I think it's <laughs> it's really interesting where it's going. Um, the, a lot of interesting things in the maps. One thing that jumped out at me are big state boundary effects on the mortality maps. You know, why would all of New York and Pennsylvania have uniformly higher rates than Ohio? And I wonder if that's because of census tree linking, because I don't know why the MLP would do it. I don't know why they're, I don't think that's an actual mortality rate that's uniformly the same on a different state, but maybe it's the census tree. I'm not, I, don't know I mean, I, here's what I think. Uh, it was a great question, but I didn't give you enough information uh, here is that um, uh, right now we're, we're doing, when we map, we sometimes, if there's not enough cases in a county, we use the state levels just so the maps look a little prettier, right? Uh, and that produces some of those boundary effects. The other thing is our, our undercount estimates were very noisy at the county level. And we started, uh, at least in this phase, only using undercounts estimated at the state level. And uh, so those undercounts are kids who, by definition, survive. We assume they were there in the previous census. And that can throw out for state things as well. We need to, that looks bad. It is bad. There's, you know. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, I don't understand why that 20% couldn't just be people that are pregnant. And can you explain that? Like, I just don't understand. Like, haven't those babies just not been born yet when you get them 10 years later? So I'm confused about why that's such an issue because it just seems like they're pregnant. And then my second thing is, can you hand check some of what Phyllis was mentioning? Because I always had that same question about the grandparents. Like, couldn't you just take some percentage of the of the families and follow them and see, get an estimate of what that um, error might look like? Great questions. Um, uh, so start with the first one. Um, yeah, I think that's what's happening. Uh, you know, these kids are, are they're not really 10. The next thing, you're, you're supposed to report your age on the nominal census day. How old were you on the census day? Yeah, the, uh, I need to repeat the question. She was saying, you know, that these kids could be have been, you know, just their mother was pregnant and they uh, are born and they appear at age 10, 10 years later, right? And it's not that they were undercounted in the first census, they just hadn't been born yet. And I was saying, well, if you read the instructions and did people follow the instructions? Uh, if you read the instructions, it says, what were your age on the census day? And the census enumerator in the 19th century, these are like three, four months after the enumeration in some cases. Uh, and there was a real push in 1880 to try to hap, uh, have the census happen quicker. Uh, so a lot of what we're seeing there could be this type of problem as well. Yeah. And then the second question was, can we individually look? And we have done some individual looking with, uh, you know, Joe Price is helping us uh, follow up on some of the people we think are dead and, and seeing if they can find them. But we haven't looked at the family living relationship uh, yet. And as you probably realize, anytime you say hand, do something by hand, your productivity from millions of cases goes down to, to tens and twenties uh, in a sense. And it takes a lot of effort, but it's a great idea. Uh, and we need to do more of it. I mean, we've been searching for people, but we should probably see where they're living when we find them. That's a great idea. Uh, um, so I, I thought it was great that you did the comparison of, you know, to the 1900, 1910, where you have the data. I was actually really curious if you could do a household level comparison, like what is the fraction of households in which the data that you get from your method agrees or disagrees with the data that's reported by the individual. And you can also then see how does that change across socioeconomic status, across all sorts of things where people might worry that, you know, the reporting is different across these. Um, yeah, I've been and, thinking and about you dig into that. About the kind of found it, by the way. When you report children never born and children surviving, um, there's no indication of when those children were born. It could have been children born in 1870. Uh, 30 years I, earlier. It's hard to determine then also our, um, uh, so you want to know living children in 1900, how many of those died kind of thing. So we have been trying to do that through other sources, not through the children never born, children surviving. They, they just don't match in a, in a way that makes. You also use younger parents so that you can balance their beginning of fertility. Oh yeah, yeah. We have another paper that's published where we look at the net added children and net missing. Uh, over periods, uh, um, 
you'd be surprised. Uh, it seems so simple, but when you start trying to, to do this, it, it, it also would be, yeah. Dana. Yeah. Well, so just thinking more about this, this issue about kids when they're born relative to enumeration, actual enumeration and enumeration day. Well, one of the ways that I've sort of addressed this in my modern undercount work, which of course uses data that you don't have, is thinking about, well, um, you know, using birth estimates of birth cyclicality and, and things like that, like, you know, more, more children are born certain months of the year versus others. And so I don't know, I mean, you could use like the, the oldest data you have on birth month and try to get some estimates of birth cyclicality and sort of use yeah. that. Like if you yeah. make some pretty giant assumptions about the cyclicality that you see versus you could kind of get, maybe get a little bit finer estimates on, you know, how, how bad this sort of issue yeah. is in terms of the, you know, the difference between when you're born and when enumeration yeah. happened. Yeah. I, I, there are birth month. That's an interesting idea. There's also a census of mortality in four years where they uh, are supposed to enumerate the people who died in the previous year, not the previous 10. And so there's maybe something we can do there as well, you know, back to the, your idea of linking actual people, which, uh, you know, do we, yeah. Elizabeth? Um, I don't. Uh, there you are. Thank you. This is great. Um, this level of engagement with this is extremely high. And so we wanted to see uh, if we did more programming on the MLP and the uses of it, how much interest there would be. So if you would attend something like that, just come and maybe let me know and, and we'll keep track. But um, just wanted to thank you for just a fantastic presentation. A couple more questions, but I'll get them afterwards, right? Thanks. See, I think you had a question back there. You had a question, Emily. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, huh. I'm, what's your answer? 